I'm uh, David Scare, and I teach in the area of systematic theology and New Testament. I have a particular interest in the Sermon on the Mount and the Gospel of Matthew. My book, The uh, Sermon on the Mount, the Church's First Statement of the Gospel, is, is now out of print. And so it, uh, for anything which we do not cover today, uh, that can be consulted if you're able to get a copy. Uh, we're going to speak on the Gospel appointed for Ash Wednesday, which is taken from the Sermon on the Mount, chapters uh, 6, 1 to 6, and from 16 to 21. Um, uh, what is contained here in the Sermon on the Mount at this particular point certainly uh, reflects a very ancient tradition. Uh, the, strangely, the closest thing that we have to it in the apostolic era is the, um, is the Didache. Uh, the Sermon on the, the, the Didache probably, is, in some sense, is copied after the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount lays down the foundational behavior for Christians in the community. There are five discourses in Matthew, and this is the first discourse. Uh, the uh, section which has been appointed for today has been appointed for the Ash Wednesday uh, for, uh, has to do particularly with liturgical instructions. Uh, or should say instructions for the community. Here are instructions on how you are to fast, how you are to give money, and how you are uh, to pray. And um, it's, uh, they have, uh, whoever prepared the, uh, the pericope for this, uh, for Ash Wednesday, um, have left out it stops at verse, it goes from 1 to 6 in the 6th chapter of Matthew, and then it picks up in the, uh, in the 16th. And of course, you're going to note, note that. Of course, if you're using a lectionary, you might not see it. But right in the middle of this happens to be the Lord's Prayer. So the first section has to do with how you give your money. The section on the Lord's Prayer from 7 to 15, how, what you're supposed to say when you pray the Lord's Prayer, and then uh, 16 has to do with fasting. Now what's intriguing is that um, this church holiday uh, seems to attract the attention of the secular world, which is kind of amazing. Because if you had to pick out church holidays that uh, people outside the church are aware of, it would be Christmas, which is becoming less and less of a holiday, even a Christian one, and Easter, which is still generally observed. And it will be noted in the, in the media that this is Ash Wednesday, and the proper behavior on Ash Wednesday is to fast. Of course, uh, 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 the, the Catholic tradition is not only that you fast, but that you abstain from meat in honor of Jesus, who offered his physical life as an atonement. Uh, it seems to be a strange attraction to this part of the gospel. Um, it might be that this uh, it might be this that this is this one section of the Sermon on the Mount that points to our own mortality. Um, some of the churches it's becoming cus uh, customary in Lutheran congregations to have the imposition of ass asses, the ashes. And um, this, it's a very meaningful, uh, it's a very meaningful custom because uh, the, the pastor or the one who administers the ashes says, um, man, thou art dust, thou art dust, O man, and to dust shalt thou return. It has to, it really is, a t Ash Wednesday is really getting ready for our funeral, our own funeral, to put it in another way, Ash Wednesday is part of everybody's funeral preparation. It might be that reason. It might be for that reason that people make something, make of, uh, make something of Ash Wednesday. Now this pericope 
at least according to the uh, Lutheran standards of justification by grace through faith, doesn't really match up. And that really doesn't bother us in heaven. I mean, it doesn't really bother us. Because what we have here is a picture of the judgment. And the judgment is going to be based upon what we do. So in the uh, first verse, chapter 6, verse verse 1, there is this, Beware that you, of doing your, that you do not do your righteousness before human beings in order to be seen by them. Uh, for you will not have your reward with your Father in the heavens. Now that's really a great phrase. Because when it says, your Father in the heavens, this really is a preparation for the Lord's Prayer, which is not our Father who art in heaven, but our Father who art in the heavens. Now this section is intended only for Christians, only for believers, because it speaks about your Father. Um, this is a description of what God is in himself. And the picture here is, the picture here is God sitting in judgment. So the, so the individual, when he does something in the world, something which is very significant, he should, be, he should re, uh, re, think about in whose presence he's doing that. You know, the one way to um, make sure you don't enjoy yourself at a party is to bring your mother. Now, the analogy might, exa might not exactly fit. However, it says, when you do these things, think of who, in whose presence you're doing them. And you're doing them in the presence of God. Now, in the second verse there, it speaks about mercy. It's our, uh, um, it speaks about oh, one of the uh, mottos of the Missouri Center is great mercy and life together. I believe that's it. And here, uh, the word uh, mercy, by the way, it refers to the giving of alms, the giving of money. In England, um, the contributions to the church are still called alms. And uh, the Jewish people were very generous. They still are very generous. Perhaps they might even be more generous than Christians are, but they're generous. So the, um, when it says, when you do your almsgiving, don't blow, the, uh, don't blow the trumpet before you. Now, there is absolutely no reference anywhere in any of the literature that anybody gave their money uh, by hiring uh, someone to play the trumpet to go down the street before them. Uh, the easiest reference to this is don't blow your own horn. Um, uh, whatever you do, don't tell anybody about it. And then you have the introduction there of the hypocrites. The hypocrites do the same thing in the synagogues. Of course, I'm always kind of amused um, on, on two accounts. One, when you read the newspaper and you find out that somebody has made a contribution of $5,000 to this or that college, well, with all due respect, $5,000 is peanuts. We have people in our congregations who are giving much, much more money and never call attention to themselves. The other thing is um, celebrities, the people um, who, make the, the, who make big salaries in the, sh in the entertainment business and so forth, or in Microsoft, for example. They give huge sums of money and they are greatly admired for that. I think there's a warning about here, by the way, uh, that um, Jesus says these people already have their rewards because what they want to do is they're getting, uh, they're doing good, uh, not necessarily for their, uh, they're doing good, not for the, they, other people benefit by it. So we should never in any way degrade any type of, of charitable work. Uh, but their ultimate purpose, by the way, of course, there are tax advantages to it too. The government's going to take the money away. But what they really want to do is they want a little fame in the sun. They want to stand in the limelight. They want to be known for how gracious and how wonderful they are. Um, I don't think that's really a, something that we should think about on, on Ash Wednesday at all. Um, we should just let them alone. What is significant is that Jesus says they have their reward. 
it almost looks like this is a kind of an un-Lutheran pericope. Because if you do, if you pray in secret, if you give in secret, the Heavenly Father will reward you. This is a picture of the last judgment when the judgment to condemnation and the, condemna and the judgment to salvation is based upon what the people do. The word rewards appears in this particular pericope in several places. Um, you might see it there in about the fourth, fifth line. I say to you, they have their reward. The word for reward or payment, really their salary, is mython. That's, that's, I think that's marvelous. Because they're doing a work. And everybody, or everybody who does a work expects a wage. And they have their wage. And uh, in verse 3, all of this to me looks very authentic as coming from Jesus himself, because the language, in comparison to other sections of the New Testament, is very Jewish and, we might even say, primitive. Because he says, do not let your left hand know, your, uh, your left hand know what, your right, what your right hand is doing. Uh, I don't know if we have to say that that's a metaphor or an example or an analogy. It's amazing how that particular phrase has crept into the English language and a lot of people use it who are not even Christians. What the phrase means is that when you're engaged in charitable forgiving, forget what you've done. You understand that what you have done is not really all that important. It shouldn't be important to you for this reason because whatever you have is eventually going to be taken away from you anyway. And then uh, the, this, what is this? It's, it's, I think when you're, when you're working on this pericope for a sermon, I think you have to look at the middle section from verses 7, uh, uh, seven to 15, because here you have the Lord's Prayer. And many of the items which are found up here are going to reappear down here, down here in the Lord's Prayer. Um, because there is, uh, it, there is information here about when you are to pray. If making a spectacle of yourself and giving something is not a very good idea, then it's not a very good idea to make a, yourself a spectacle in praying. Uh, I had this, I had this ex experience. I was coming back, and this has to be about 25 years ago. I was coming back across the Pacific, and there was an ascetic Jew. And he asked to be put up in the front of the plane so he could say his prayers. So he got up and said his prayers publicly, hitting his head against the wall. Now that's something you don't forget. Your holiness and your piety is not determined by your public display of doing Religi uh, specifically religious holy things. As Jesus says, um, as he says in verse 5, they will be seen by men. For truly I say to you, they have their reward. I, you, we cannot, you, it would be difficult to say that we, have, we could develop a Christology out of this particular section. In other words, where do you find Christ? Well, you find it in if we, don't, if we don't see Christ here, then the fault lies with us. For this reason, it says right here at, in verse 5, For I say unto you, right here, For I say unto you, they have their reward. Who does Jesus think he is? Truly, I say to you, I really mean it, they already have their reward. When you pray, go into the corner, and lock the door and pray to your Father in the heaven and your Father in the heaven will reward you. Now, if you will notice this, that the evangelist changes, this prayer is intended for the Christian community because it stands off with the Father of all Christians. If you will not have your reward with your Father, and that's plural, who is in the heavens. That anticipates the Lord's Prayer. 
then the attention comes down to the practice of the individual Christian of what he is to do. You are to pray secretly, and your Father will reward you in secret. Now, whether the word in secret is, is in the text, that's, that's a questionable thing. But you will be rewarded. Now, the, the concept, uh, the scene of the judgment of uh, believers will not come up in a significant way to chapter 25 in Matthew, in the, in the, in the judgment scene of the sheep and the goats. One, go, one comes to the, one our sent group is sent into everlasting condemnation, everlasting fire. The other is sent in, uh, are, is placed by the side of Jesus. I think it has to be noted that the Gospel of Matthew does not save the judgment, concept of judgment until the end of the Gospel, but that in every step of the Christian life, God is passing judgment. And its judgment is right here. Because you pray to the Father in secret, and the Father will reward you. Now, where he will reward you doesn't say. But it does matter what you do, and God remembers the, these things. And then comes the Lord's Prayer. I'm not so sure that this should have been left out of the pericope, and I don't know how much time uh, we have to develop to this. Um, if it seems as if the Lord's Prayer at this, I mean, the, the Sermon on the Mount at this point is too harsh, there has to be a reason that the evangelist put the Lord's Prayer in at this place. So, for example, uh, verses 1 to 6 tells you how to give money and how to pray, but it doesn't tell you what to pray. Um, Apparently, that's, that is not a matter of, uh, of discretion, if you, what you were going to pray. Now, here we're going to, we already know that there's a big difference between how Lutherans worship and evangelicals and most Protestants worship. And that is, it is absolutely customary in Lutheran worship that the Lord's Prayer be prayed. That's not an option. And... Um, the reason why we should look at the Lord's Prayer at this particular time, because if you're going to uh, work with a law gospel paradigm, and I'm not saying that you have to do here, because I'm not so sure that it fits, but you could derive it out of uh, verses 7 through 15 for this reason, because any, the solution to man's dilemma is found in the uh, in the. 11th verse and the 12th verse uh, where it says uh, the, our bread from above give us today and release to us our debts as we forgive those or release those who are indebted to us and do not put us in do, do, not, do not lead us into temptation but rescue us from the evil one. Um, and then comes this, the, the end there, by the way. For if you do not release to human beings their debts, their trespasses, neither, neither will your father release your debts. Here again, the concept of judgment comes up. God is coming in judgment. Uh, if there is a day in the uh, year in which people kind of feel uh, the judgment of God, it should be this. I'd like to make a few comments, by the way, of the Lord's Prayer. Because it is not an option to omit the Lord's Prayer. First of all, take a look at what the prayers are to be offered. In verse 7 it says, We are not to babble like pagans. For they think they will be heard for their much, much praying. So there is absolutely a good friend of mine, Bill Hampton, an ELCA pastor who was a great supporter of missionary courses and always attended, who was a faithful attender at seminary events. He was a captain in the Navy, a tall man. He recently died. I really miss him. I would call him up when I found out that he had, uh, he had cancer 
Uh, when he found out he had cancer this summer, and I began telephoning him, he put a notice in the uh, his church bulletin that he didn't want any prayer, uh, prayer circles for himself. Didn't want any, he, didn't want his, he didn't at all. He was quite content with his thing. And here, the length of the prayer does not determine its value. You know, we're, very, uh, we're so concerned about being politically correct. And here, Jesus more or less slanders the pagans, the Gentiles. Don't be like those people because they think they're, for their much speaking, they will be heard. And it says here, you can have the assurance that God will hear you. And then comes this beautiful phrase. In Latin, pater noster quies in celis. And in Greek there, you see it. The pater hemon en, ha, en tois uranois. The father of us who is in the heavens. Now, the first part of the first pericope we were looking at uh, from uh, verses 1 through 6. It speaks about the individual life of the Christian, what he is to do. But what he does in private is only a reflection of what he does in the public worship. Whenever he prays the Lord's Prayer, he is thinking of what is happening on Sunday morning. It is not that the individual faith contributes to what happens on the Sunday morning, but the Sunday morning service is the substance from which the individual's piety is developed. So it doesn't say, my Father who is in the heavens. It says, our Father. It doesn't say, in the heaven, as if it were a place. Now this always comes up a question, and the question, uh, the word heaven appears here in several places, in, in this gospel, it'll always come up and say, well, you Christians believe that God's in, a, uh, God's in a particular place, and what are you going to do about that? And we know that scientifically, what we know about the universe, that seems very unlikely. No, when it says the, the word heavens, the kingdom of the heavens, it means the activity of God, specifically the saving activity of God. And in here, there is hope for the individual, because in verse 12, we have, in verse 11, we really have the heart of the prayer. The first part of the prayer ends at verse 10. There's the address, our Father who is in the heavens. Then come the three petitions, as may your will be done, um, as in heaven, also on earth. Now here it refers to the realm of God, apart from the earth. All good things happen in heaven, but they're not happening on earth, and that's what we pray for. And then comes what will help the individual as he is in this world. And the answer is, it's a reference to the sacrament. Give us, give us the supernatural bread today. We need it. And notice the chi. And by this, our sins will be forgiven. And we have, just as we have already forgiven the sins of other people. There you, you have the heart of the Christian faith. You have the atonement of Christ. <coughs> you have the <coughs> reception of the uh, forgiveness of sins. And then you also find <coughs> release from Satan. <coughs> you find rescue. The weird word should really be, and rescue us from the evil one. Now we're not going to change that. And then comes a warning. The warning to, is this is a warning not of the law but a warning of those people who don't take the gospel seriously. For it says, uh, if you do not, verse 15, if you do not forgive or release to men <coughs> their trespasses, neither will your Father release to you your trespasses. Another reference to the, judge, to the judgment day. Now we get to, in verse 16, we get to uh, one of the uh, chief uh, chief uh, facets, or really the main facet of, of, of Ash Wednesday, and that's the beginning of uh, the beginning of the Lenten fast that we do without uh, that we do without food. Now you may already be aware of this: that Lent originally only consisted of what uh, was only about three days before Easter, when it began to be celebrated. 
Now, Easter probably is the first day, the first holiday to be celebrated in the church. Probably it was already in place uh, during the apostolic period because uh, Paul says that he hopes to get to Corinth in order to celebrate the Passover with them. I mean, he had a sense. We have that sense too. There are uncertain church religious holidays. We like to be at a certain church. We like to be with family or with certain people. So Easter had that. Well, if you're going to celebrate Easter, then you're also going to commemorate uh, why we have Easter. I mean, why you can't. If we're going to celebrate the resurrection of the dead, well, we have to find out who are the dead. And of course, the dead is Jesus Christ. So, that, so we have the commemoration of Good Friday and, of, uh, and the burial of Jesus also on, fr also on Friday. Um, the, um, the period of penance before Easter, which as an ancient tradition, was not intended for the entire congregation. It was intended only for those who had been excommunicated by, uh, by the church or who had been put under discipline and they were not allowed to receive the sacrament. And the period of discipline was Lent, uh, the few days before Easter. Well, that came to be expanded, and we can understand that. Why it's 40 days? Because it certainly mat matches the 40 days in which Jesus is in the, the wilderness. And then it went like this. Well, we should, uh, if these people here have to suffer by fasting and going without food or whatever discipline, why don't we all do it? That's, there is absolutely no religious significance for a 40-day day Lent. And of course, we already know that the enthusiasm with which Lent is met, uh, is met on Ash Wednesday pretty well fizzles out in a week. See, uh, Ash Wednesday is a day very much like, the, uh, like uh, New Year's in which we make resolutions. We make resolutions, and they don't last very long at all. And so, um, this, at least from my observation, is that the, our, serve, our attendance at our Lenten services, uh, will, you might get a, a pretty decent crowd on Ash Wednesday. You won't do so well on the following Wednesdays as you get closer to, closer to Easter. But that, why not? We, we cannot cut back on the church holidays. We cannot have less holidays just to accommodate um, people's lack of willingness to go to church. And of course, well, the whole purpose of Lent is to concentrate on the sufferings of Christ. And from my point of view, we should be singing as many Lenten hymns as possible. And knowing the Passion history, I'm not in favor, by the way, of using the harmony of the Gospels, which used to be in the, um, I don't know whether it's in, in the New Lectionary or not. I don't have a congregation and I'm not so sure that I can afford it, so I would use it once in my lifetime. But we should let every evangelist speak for himself. And it's a, it's a magnificent story. Now, the question of Lent is not the concentration on the sufferings of Christ. Even though Ash Wednesday has to do the beginning of Lent, which is the season of, con of concentration on the sufferings of Christ, it, it, looks, it has to do, at least according to this traditional pericope, this per traditional section taken from Matthew has to do with the individual. It doesn't speak about the sufferings of Christ. It, may, it presupposes it. That's why the Lord's Prayer is so significant because it has the phrase, and forgive us our trespasses, which assumes the atonement. It also assumes the sacrament, but it's on us. So it says, when you fast, do not be as the hypocrites. Well, you can say, you can quote Luther's catechism that fasting indeed is a fine, a fine outward bodily training. That's always good to quote the catechism that makes Lutherans feel good. But I think there is something more profound in fasting which all of us experience. And that is, and I can think of any number of episodes and you can figure this out. It says, when you fast, there are three things that Christian, these early Christians did in this community. They gave money, they prayed, and they fasted. And the regulations for the prayers are the public prayers and also the private prayers. And the fasting, by the way, is to be, is to be done in private. And that is, 
I don't know about you, but I'm, whenever I travel, maybe it's because I'm more self-centered than anybody else, but I always am concerned that I will get someplace where there won't be food. And uh, uh, so you bring along a couple of bars, you stick them in the, your pocket or your suitcase, whatever, whatever it is. And if you happen to be a parent, you also know this, that children cannot go without food for a very long time. Therefore, when you get into the car to make a trip, even if it's only 100 miles, you've got to bring along food. Now, I think the significance of fasting is not what does it mean to find outward bodily training. The purpose of fasting is to indicate how mortal we are. That no matter how high, highly we think of ourselves, we are all headed to doom. We, we, we are not as wonderful as we might think we are. We are frail people. And even the absence of water for us, uh, you can know with your children, the absence of, of water for a small time, the kid gets, I like to bring up this, uh, uh, this illustration, just to prove it, is that the mother comes home from working, picks up the kid at the daycare, and the kid is beside himself. Well, what's the problem? Well, then the mother says, time out. The kid is not having a discipline problem. The, his existence, that child's existence, is very frail and needs something to keep it going. So here where it says when we're fast, we come to the realization that we're not going to live very long. Ash Wednesday happens to be everybody's funeral day. It is the beginning of our death at this particular time when you fast. That's the purpose. And fasting does have, <laughs> you don't like to bring up medical, uh, medical procedures, but many of us have before having a medical procedure, have to fast. I don't know about you, but I have to have my blood drawn every uh, twice a year. And uh, at six o'clock in the evening, no food. Oh, you, what happens at seven o'clock? You're starving to death. You go get your blood and you can't do it. Now, all of this, I think, should be brought up because the Gospels do not have to do with us. The preaching of Jesus does not have to do with us. It has to do with him primarily. Ash Wednesday is different because it has to do with us. There are instructions which we are to carry out. These are all in the imperative. And this is kind of strange for this reason. This is not law, by the way. That's not law at all. Uh, it, 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 it calls us to think. It's more than a reminder. These instructions force us to look at the reality of who we are, and we are not very much. See, the, the, part, the point of the imposition of the ashes um, is somewhat of a perversion. Thou, thou art du uh, dust to dust and ashes to ashes. Some people will say, well, the Bible doesn't speak about ashes. But you have um, uh, uh, in the Old Testament with Job and other people, uh, sackcloth and ashes. Uh, the, the Old Testament lesson will be about sackcloth and ashes. Sackcloth means basically, I don't know, I think we've all had it. Some clothes simply are uncomfortable. Now they have really changed the fabrics very much, but at least as I can remember, a wool clothing against the skin was kind of made you itch and very uncomfortable. Sackcloth brought your whole reality into, you cannot run away from the inconvenience and a kind of a mild agony that's imposed by sackcloth. And ashes is, dear friend, you are on the way to the grave. And, it's, and I think it's a very healthy thing that this should happen. Uh, from the viewpoint is that why did Jesus do what he had to do? And the answer is because without him, you would be destined to the grave without any hope at all. And you do not understand the gospel unless you see, unless you see that. And there is also here a warning against false humility. Who's the uh, figure in uh, The Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens? 
Some people work on being humble. They give, they, 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 really, they, they give the impression, woe is me. All the world, they present themselves as suffering. And Jesus says, you're not supposed to do that. I, 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 a man I, I meet when I go to the health club in the morning, speaking about his mother. His mother lost her husband, her daughter, and her brother within a period of a month. And she's accepting all of it. The, uh, the thought here, by the way, is that we do not, we live as if we have hope. We do not live with our, with our, uh, with our, with our faces drawn at all. That's what Jesus says. Now, you know, he speaks about uh, a, a, a presenting an attractive faith. Don't uh, call attention to your, to your miserable condition. That's something between you and God. This, by the way, is the discourse on the Father. Jesus does not introduce himself in this particular, in the, in the, uh, in the Ash Wednesday Gospel at all. Oh, only in the sense, I say unto you. But all of the attention is on the Father. The Father is the one to whom we are pray, to, to be prayed. That should be remembered. The prayers are to the Father. Jesus brings himself in as the one who is the correct interpreter of what the Father, of what the Father says. And then there's a discourse on, uh, there's a discourse on money. Oh yes, money. It says, lay up not for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust does corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. I absolutely am overpowered by the Sermon on the Mount. It's not a very popular Lutheran part of the Bible because it speaks of judgment and what's going to happen. It just appears to me that behind the Sermon on the Mount, behind the preaching of Jesus, is the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, you know, if you happen to be a little depressed, don't read the book of Ecclesiastes because it will push you over the end. The fellow is uh, probably Solomon, has reached the end of his life. He has enjoyed all the pleasures of the earth, and he now concludes that it, life has nothing to offer, offer at all. It's totally desperate. Whether you're rich or you're poor, as you get older, you have absolutely nothing. It does it. I'm always amazed that when a famous person dies with, a, with, a, with millions upon millions of dollars, the newspapers report that as if that's a great accomplishment. I'm thinking of the fellow who founded my microscope, Steve Jobs. I mean, what a great man, great intellect, great personality, a great wealth, one of the billions, one of the great. But yes, what, what faced with death, that means absolutely nothing. And that's what Jesus speaks about, about don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. And he's very clever here. Because he speaks about moth and rust. There are two things that destroy things. Rust is a kind of a chemical or physical process. And moth happens to be animals. Sooner or later, it will all disappear. Now, the argument is this. That forget about believing in God. We're all destined to the same place. Is that a morose thought? Yes. But that's what... That's what Ash Wednesday is about. This is why we have this particular pericope. We didn't say this. It's Jesus who said this. It says, do not lay up for yourself treasures on the earth. That's in verse, uh, that's in verse 19 here. Do not lay up treasures. Why? Because sooner or later it will all pass away. Now today, I, one of our students, a fourth year guy, had a a marvelous looking coat on. And I said, I bet that's cashmere. Where'd you get it? He got it at the clothing bank. And um, the, somebody contributed that coat to the clothing bank so he could do it. But all clothing, no matter all clothing, eventually goes through a process where it eventually disappears. It has absolutely no value at all. It all disappears. 
That's why I believe that the book of Ecclesiastes is, is behind us. It has to do with our, our own personal disintegration. And then it ends this way. Uh, by, the, uh, by, the, or wait, what, oh, by the way, what is not ruined by, uh, uh, by, uh, by a natural process, it says thieves come and, and steal. And I read the paper. I, I read the paper. There have certainly been a lot of robberies. People go, they don't get very much money. But they go into gas stations and convenience stores and supermarkets. They take money. If you, and if, for some of us, if our money isn't stolen, we lose it. There is absolutely nothing permanent. That's the per, that is the whole story of the, this pericope for Ash Wednesday. And then Jesus said, lay up for yourself um, treasures in heaven. And he, what's significant here is that he repeats the words moth and rust. Seis, kai, brosis. He repeats it. Where they don't whittle away at things. You see, there are two ways of losing at things. If you're held up on the street, you lose it in a few minutes. My mother's house in Brooklyn, she was robbed twice. It doesn't take that long. It just, it, it gets lost. That's why we have insurance, because people do steal. That's quick. Other things we lose the, over a shorter period of time. Now the answer is this, that you are to lay up treasures in heaven for, for where your treasure is, there is your heart also. Now this is absolutely magnificent. This is one of those sections where you have to figure, what are the treasures? Sometimes, you know, Jesus priceless treasure. No, no. That's not what it is. I think the evidence point that the treasures in heaven are other people. And that is by your investment in what you do for other people, including bringing them into church and bringing them to the faith, they are the, that is the true treasures. And here is an invitation for really a positive, a positive celebration of Lent that we should, it should really be, I know some Catholic churches have it, this should really be a mission period. A period in which we bring people into church for this reason. Because at the heart of our Christian faith happens to be the crucifixion of Jesus. And the Lent is the time for the crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, I, I love this pericope very much. I like everything about it. And uh, I wish you all a very satisfying Lent. <laughs>